Thank you very much. Um, okay, so dark matter. Dark matter is really interesting, right? Uh, we know that it exists. We know that it's a new particle. Uh, uh, it's not a modification of the law of gravity or something. It's a new particle. And that sense is conclusive evidence that there is something on the other side of the model. Uh, it's a new particle out there. Thank you. And uh, like most other particles that we know about, this dark matter particle probably has non gravitational interactions. Now, we have these non gravitational interactions, it's very important to identify them. Because by doing so, not only do we understand something about the origin of dark matter, where it comes from, why it is what it is, but also it gives us a window into a totally new sector of the universe. So that's something really important to do. However, how do you find something when you don't know what it is? What you do is that you hypothesize that the dark matter in the universe carries a certain property. Then you go build a detector and see if the dark matter in the, in the world actually responds to that detector. If you succeed, uh, you are identified by dark matter, even then far really close to this particular building, even on days that you don't need the cold frame. So it's really something very good to do. However, this is really challenging, right? The reason why we call dark matter as dark is because it doesn't really interact very much with us. So all of the effects are going to be really small. So obviously one needs a technique that's got very high precision to go after it. The last two decades or so, there, there have been some really impressive developments in the field of, of, of precision instruments. Some of them actually pioneer here at Virgin. For example, now with squid and atomic magnetometers, one can measure really small magnetic fields at the, at the, at the sub pepper decimal level. And then, due to advancements in both atomic and optical interferometers, one can measure accelerations that are really small as well. Furthermore, both these fields have a lot of rapid technological developments. So, one can basically ask, how can one leverage these new technologies to detect new physics? And that's kind of the goal of this talk. So let me start with sort of providing you a brief theory overview, talking about the kinds of dark matter particles that are of most interest to me. After that, we'll talk about three new experimental proposals. One is to detect something called an axion with NMR technology. The second is to detect something called a dark photon with a radio, kind of a fancy radio, an LC oscillator. And finally, I'll talk about something called a B minus L gauge boson. I'll tell you what it is, and I'll tell you how to detect that with an axial rubber. After that, I can do. So before we get into details about the physics, right, let's step back for a second and ask a simple question. What do we know about the mass of our matter? What can that be? Naively, it can be anywhere from, from about 10 to the minus 43 GeV to about 10 to the 19 GeV, from the Hubble scale to the Planck scale, the scales that are accessible to, to us as part of the physics. That's about 50 orders of magnitude. But we can do slightly better. We know that dark matter exists in the galaxy, it's got to fit inside the galaxy. And that turns out to put a lower limit on the mass of the dark matter. The basic idea is that the dark matter is say much lighter than about 100 EV and happens to be a fermion. Then if you try to pack it into the galaxy, you get into, into problems with Fermi degeneracy. Right? You can't really put more than one fermion per mole. So if it's below 100 EV, it's got to be bosonic. Bosons, of course, have no such problems. You can pack as many bosons as you want. No big deal. However, if the mass of the boson gets really light, then there'll, there'll come to be a point where its de Broglie wavelength gets bigger than the size of the galaxy. Okay? And that sets this level at about 10 to the minus 22 EV. So, but that's pretty much all we know, right? This is the only observational bound we have on the mass of dark matter. And there are still many, many orders of magnitude that we have here. Anything beyond this is essentially a, a good theoretical guess, right? You basically take a guess based upon what else we know about physics. And then you hypothesize, well, maybe the dark matter is over there. And there are good guesses and bad guesses, but still, it's still a guess. And, and the thing about guessing in this game is that you want to guess as much as possible to cover as, as to, to cover the largest possible parameter space as possible. Now, one very reasonable guess is that the dark matter somehow is associated with the weak scale, right? Standard model is one scale that we know about is the weak scale, and uh, that's the WIMP hypothesis that the dark matter is also associated with that scale. And that's got other things going for it, thermal annihilation, thermal free etc., etc. 
and as a very well motivated government a candidate, and we should really do everything we can to pursue the entire urban parameter space as possible. But still, that's just one guess. There are other very reasonable candidates uh, from particle physics, you know, things that are easy to get. Uh, those are called axions and massive vector bosons. These are also very easily dark matter candidates. And to just tell you how easy it is to get these things as dark matter candidates, let me just sort of give you a very, you know, one uh, slide summary of what an axion is, right? All you have to do is mumble the following words. There's a global symmetry broken at some high scale FA. That's all you have to say. That gives you an axion. That's it. Okay. Uh, and we don't know much about these particles. Uh, all of this physics is basically set by this very high scale effect. Once you know that scale, you know everything, but you don't know what it is. And there is some theory prejudice to think that these scales are you know, close to the grand unified scales or the bump scales, but that's typically where we expect these symmetries to be broken. Uh, you know, so that's good motivation to go find these things, but really you should search the entire parameter space as possible. Similarly, we can also get really, really light vector bosons. Okay, so these are really, really easy to get from theory. And so the goal of the stock is basically to ask, how do we search these particles? Okay, if they happen in the dark matter. In particular, I'm interested in particles whose masses are about a gigahertz to about a hertz, to about 10 to the minus 6 EV to about 10 to the minus 15 EV, that range. Okay. And to some extent, that range was chosen uh, because it includes a popular candidate called the GCD axiom. But really, you know, what you really search for So how can these really light bosons be dark matter? How can they be dark matter? Right. Before we get to dark matter, let's understand a simpler uh, boson, the photon. And here is the photon that's sort of coming out of a laser. Okay. How do you describe that photon? Well, there's a time varying electromagnetic field associated with it. E naught, cosine, omega, T minus omega x. Uh, e naught, of course, is the amplitude of the photon. It tells you how much energy density there is in that field. Uh, and omega, of course, is the frequency. And one way to detect this photon would be to measure the time varying electric field associated with it. Okay, that's a good way to go find it. Let's move on to dark. Now let's move on to dark matter. So uh, the basic idea of dark matter is that uh, there's a field like an axion or a, you know some vector boson or whatever. And much like how I can write the photon in this particular manner, I can also write that uh, field in the same way: a naught cosine nt. There's one important difference: these are massive particles; they're not relativistic. So basically, I, I don't have to have any uh, field momentum. All of it can just be in the map. Okay, but that's basically it. And uh, A naught, of course, sets the amplitude of the field. If A naught is non zero, there will be some energy density. Okay? And because this is uh, a cold particle, it's got no momentum, uh, it basically looks like dark matter. Okay? M squared, A squared, the local dark matter density. And this is basically how these guys become dark matter is that in the early universe, there is no particular reason why the field value had to be zero. It will in general have some value. And once it has some value, that will contribute to the local dark matter density. So, more or less, once this field exists, it's super easy for this guy to dark matter. And that's why it's very well motivated. Right? Uh, from a theoretical bit, point of view, it's not that hard to get these fields. And once you have them, it's dark matter. And of course, in the early universe, these fields basically look spatially uniform. They have the same value throughout the entire universe. And it'll be oscillating back and forth, much like how a photon would be asked for. Of course, we don't live in the early universe. We live today in a much more boring time. Uh, and the field today looks like this. Right, it's fallen into the galaxy, it's got all these bumps and wiggles, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I can still define a two-point function. Okay, I can basically ask the field value of something here, how far do I have to go before it becomes all one different? Okay. And that's just a correlation length. Now if you think about that in Fourier space for a second, you immediately realize that this correlation length should be set by the de Broglie wavelength of the field. Right? Because if my field value is changing from one place to another, there's a momentum associated with that. And that tells me that the minimum correlation length I can have is 1 over mb, where m is the mass of the particle, and b is the velocity of dark matter of the galaxy. However, what we care about today is not just the correlation length, we care about like a, like a correlation time. Because when you do experiments, you care about how long you can sit and, 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 and enjoy this correlation. So, uh, how do we compute the temporal coherence? Well, basically, there are some detectors sitting somewhere here, and we basically ask how long does it take for us to traverse a distance of size 1 over mb. So the relative velocity between the Earth's and the dark matter is also b. So the coherence time is then 1 over mb divided by b, or 1 over mb squared. Okay. And b is about 10 to minus 3. So if the mass of the particle happened to be, say, about a megahertz, just to sort of pull a number, you kind of see that the coherence time is order of a second. Right? So this is very short compared to cosmological evolution, compared to Hubble or something like that. But on a experimental time scale, that's still very interesting. This is a coherence time that is acceptable in the lab. Okay. That's kind of what makes these particles very interesting. 
Another way of thinking about this golden time is to simply say that in the early universe, all of the power of the field was in one frequency, the mass. And today, it's in the galaxy, there's a kinetic energy that's spread out by one over by sort of mv squared, which means the golden time is one over mv squared. Okay. So that's how you think about this. Um, in the galaxy today, there's a short golden time, but interesting for experimental. And that's how we're going to detect these fields, right? Uh, there's an oscillating field here, much like how you detect a photon by this oscillating electromagnetic field. You can detect these dark matter fields by looking for the oscillating effects that they cause. There's a possibility of a resonance because there is some coherence time here, right? They're not immediately become decoherent. And the, the maximum you can gain from a resonance is about 10 to the 6. Basically, set with the fact that the coherence time is, you know, 1 over mv squared. And if you measure that in the units of frequency, the coherence, uh, the, the quality factor is 1 over v squared. And these are about 10 to the minus 3, that gives you temperature. Okay. So you can, cons you can consider some sort of resonant enhancement also possible. So that's how these particles are dark matter. Now, what kind of bosons are, are interesting to us, right? Uh, what's worth considering? Now, these are very, very light bosons, very, very light. And we want them to have interactions. So it's a reasonable thing to ask is it possible that this boson can be that light despite having this interaction, right? Quantum corrections typically tend to make these things heavy. So a reasonable thing to do is to impose a condition of naturalness. That is to say there is some symmetry that protects the mass of this boson. And once you enter those words, the game is pretty tight. Okay? The, the symmetry structures only allow a certain class of operators with which these dark bosons can talk to. There are six of them, actually. So the first possibility is that it's a spin zero particle. Okay? Uh, the spin zero particle that is basically an axiom. Okay? That's the only thing we know that protects these symmetries. They're basically these Goldstone bosons. And as I said, they're very easy to get. And once it's a spin zero boson, a Goldstone boson, it can couple to the standard model in three ways. That's it. It can couple to electromagnetism through this operator, A over F, uh, E dot B, or F dot There's a similar coupling to the gluons, and a similar and a slightly different coupling that you can have the nuclear spin, nuclear and electronic spin. The nuclear spin happen to be more interesting to me. And that's this kind of operator, D mu A. N bar gamma mu gamma phi, N but N is like a nucleon. That's it. Now there are many different kinds of axions possible. As I said, all you need is some symmetry to break. Uh, there's one linear combination that will couple the QCD, okay, with that guy. And he gets a special name. He's called the QCD axion. Because the QCD gives him a mass, it solves a strong CP problem, yada yada yada. Part of this is really fun. Okay. Uh, but in general, it can be anything. It can be you know, something that comes here, this, whatever. It's all fine. And you want to search for all of them. The second possibility is that these are spin one particles. Okay. If it's spin one, you kind of want in what is you know formally called an, an, an anomaly free way in which this particle couples the standard model. That is, you want the uh, gauge symmetries of the standard model of, of this uh, new sector to be preserved by quantum mechanics. Okay, and, and, and that's at the rather tight structure also. That gives you three more possibilities. First, it can couple the nuclear spin. So this F prime here is the gauge strength of the uh, new uh, dark gauge boson. Much like electromagnetism, and it can couple to the standard model through dipole moment. Much like how your neutron has a dipole moment under electromagnetism, your neutron can also have a dipole moment under this new gauge boson. That is that. The second is something called kinetic mixing. Okay, that is this operator, epsilon, f prime, f. F prime is the new field, and f is regular electromagnetism. And the third, your standard model particles may directly be charged under it. Okay, in that case, there's only one possibility that's remaining. It's called the p minus l gauge boson. And that has to do something with the standard model specifically. Okay, anomaly three, blah, blah, blah. But that's it. These are the six possible ways in which a light boson that is protected by symmetry can couple the standard model. And when we want this guy to be dark matter, what we do is we replace the values A, for example, here by an oscillating field. And we're going to look for the effects of this oscillating field on these operators. Okay, so the axion will just be the field directly. And for the dark photons, uh, the vector bosons, it will be like a dark electric field. Or a dark magnetic field that's oscillating. Current searches for these particles are very narrow. They are very good, but they only search for this one particular coupling, and they search for a mass range of around a gigahertz or so. That's really all they're looking for. And in this talk, we're going to talk about everything else. How do you get all these and or a much larger mass range? That brings me to my first experiment, the cosmic axion synthetic experiment, or Casper. And the lead experimentalist here is actually Dima Booker, uh, who should be here, but is not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we get into details about Casper and how it, how it works, 
Let me just sort of remind you or tell you how the current searches work. How do people currently search for axions? Okay, and, and that's a concept called ADMX. And all of the physics of the axion can basically be captured by this one parameter of FA. Okay, if you know that, you kind of know its mass, things like that. Uh, if F is above capital M and G, that's roughly where you can be axion dark matter. Okay, now this is specific to the QCD axion. So for uh, things that don't couple to QCD, the, the, the values are, 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 are a bit different. But it's sort of just to give you a generic idea of what's possible. And roughly, if F is below about 10 to the 9 GeV, uh, this part of the ruled out. They couple to strongly the standard model, they may be evident in supernova, things like that. And uh, when F is above 10 to the 12, around this narrow range, uh, that is where these microwave cavity experiments work. They are very good, they can search for axions in the limit of this particular part of ground. Okay. And the way they work is that they uh, look for the coupling of axions to electromagnetism, E dot B. So there's a magnetic field, and if you have a cavity, the axion comes in, converts to a photon, and you measure that one particular photon. Okay? Uh, that's great. But it's very hard for them to go anywhere beyond that region for two reasons. The first is, if you look at it, they're fundamentally measuring a cross-section. An axion comes in, converts to a photon. That's a cross-section. All of your operators go as 1 over f. So when you go from matrix element to cross-section, you're going to go as 1 over f squared. Not so good. The second problem is that uh, these are sort of resonant conversions again, right? So you're converting an axion resonantly to a photon, and that means the size of your cavity needs to be matched to the axion beta. That's when you have maximal conversion. When f is about 10 to the 12, it turns out that the frequencies are like a, uh, are, are about a gigahertz, so you require like centimeter sized cavity. Easy to do, easy to you know, uh, move, things like that. However, as f becomes lower, the axion wavelengths get really long. For example, at about 10 to the 16, you're talking about kilometer sized cavity. Okay? That's just very hard to do. It. That's why they can't do that. So if you have a size, if you have a cavity of fixed size, but your uh, axion wavelength gets smaller and smaller, your conversion probability takes a big hit. So this one over FQ. But together, these two things totally screw you to try to go much below, much below this particular value or kind of the So there's a real need for new theoretical ways to get there, to go to like lower mass axions or correspondingly higher mass. And that's where the ideas of Casper come in. So we first discuss sort of what I call a general axion, not the QCD axion, just an axion that you know happens some goes some goes. So, so think of a neutron that just sits out there. And now we have a neutron exposed to the dark matter wind. Okay, there's some background dark matter. And the neutron interacts with this with the axion through this operator. Okay. So if you write it in the low energy uh, you know uh, Hamiltonian limit or whatever, you basically see that the Hamiltonian for the neutron contains a term of this form. Okay, a velocity of the axion dotted with the spin of the nucleus. And that looks a lot like a magnetic field dotted with the spin of the nucleus. Right, in fact, it's exactly the same kind of operator. And what this tells you is that if you have a velocity of the of the axion, which, which you do have because you have the dark matter uh, uh, all around you and it's flowing through you, then if you explore the nuclear spin perpendicular to that direction, or in general, some direction not aligned with it, the spin will start precessing. Okay. That's the effect. So you can think of it very much as an effective time varying magnetic field, right? Uh, it's a magnetic field in a sense because of this coupling, and time varying because the axion field is also there. Okay. So uh, this looks a lot like this kind of small magnetic field that the minus 15 tells up, oscillating at a pretty high frequency. Could be anywhere from gigahertz to kilohertz to hertz. Like that. So that's what you're finding. For hidden photons, very similar, you could have a, you know, uh, the hidden photon could have a coupling to dipole moments, much like how a neutron is coupled to a magnetic field. Your hidden photon can also, uh, your, your neutron can also have a dipole moment under the hidden photon. So in that case, it was just a direct coupling, okay, uh, for the electric and magnetic fields of the dark photon. And again, the spin would rotate about that. Okay. And here it turns out that if you want to just go below uh, uh, current limits, the effective magnetic field is much bigger, for a factor of a thousand larger than the previous case. Okay. Now, how about the QCD axion? What does that do? Again, consider a neutron. And for the QCD axion, because of the specific coupling to blue ones, okay. The specific coupling, what it does is that the QCD axion induces a small electric dipole moment for neutron. Okay, so there's charge separation of the neutron that is induced by this. This happens due to some fancy QCD effects. Uh, and uh, that dipole moment will be aligned along the direction of nuclear spin. Okay, so that's what you get. And it's a small dipole moment, but importantly, it'll be oscillating at a frequency again equal to the mass of the axon. Okay, at a frequency set up on another. 
And what you can then imagine doing is you can apply the electric field perpendicular to that spin direction, and that will then forecast the spinning with that. So basically, the uh, uh, common theme that you see over here is that all of these effects are going to cause nuclear spins to persist. So if you have some way to measure that spin rotation, you can detect the axion or the hidden photon. So that's the basic idea of Casper. What we do is we take a bunch of nuclei, okay, for example, the material, you align all the spins together, uh, and then you just let the axion do its thing. So if there's an axion wind, for example, this, this coupling off of the velocity, then that will basically cause the spin to persist. Similarly, if, 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 if it was a QCD axion, you apply an electric field, then again cause the spin to persist. And the spins persist, each spin, of course, it has its own local magnetic moment, right? So that will basically create a transverse magnetization for, uh, of, of the sample, and that's something you, that you can measure with a precise magnetometer like this. So this is a lot like NMR, okay? Uh, we're trying to measure a very small magnetic field uh, through some transverse magnetization. And much like NMR, there's a po natural possibility for a resonance here. Okay, uh, all of the axion-induced effects are oscillating back and forth at a frequency equal to the mass of the axion, megahertz, that kind of frequency. Uh, so if you apply an external magnetic field and you uh, set the larval precession frequency of the sample to equal the axion mass, then you will see one place where there's a large resonance. Of course, the catch is we don't quite know what the axion mass is. So what you do is that you start with some initial magnetic field, you see if there's a big effect or not. If not, you keep changing your magnetic field, and you see if there's one point where you get a big resonance response. And uh, if you see that, you can see the action. Yeah. The advantage of doing this thing is that, in a sense, we are essentially using NMR, right? It's a very well established technology. Uh, the fundamental noise sources are very well understood, uh, and people like people have a lot of experience building these things. Uh, for the specific uh, uh, kinds of things that we need, you know, uh, you, you know, you also have some of the materials like photoelectric, etc. If you want to measure the juice of the axion, but for uh, a typical thing, you could just use the routine. Let me very briefly tell you what the fundamental source of noise is. I, I, uh, uh, this is very well measured in, in the in the NMR community, and it basically comes to the fact that these spins will sort of back and forth quantum mechanically, right? And that's been measured uh, actually by John Cross. Uh, and the key point to note here is that uh, this noise goes down with the volume that you have. So the larger the volume, uh, the spin noise decreases as one of the square volume. You need like somewhat large volume to be able to. So just to give you a brief idea of the kind of parameters we're thinking about, uh, this would be a search for general axions. Uh, we're thinking about like liquid xenon, let us say, uh, sample size of about 10 centimeters, and we, let's say we happen to polarize all of the liquid xenon. That's the kind of uh, thing that are thinking about, and we use sort of a couple of different kinds of magnetometers: single minus three Tesla, single minus seven eight. Assuming something gets better, phase four, phase one. So here is the big money plot. Uh, this is the coupling, okay, G A N N uh, of the axion to the nucleon. That's what we have for fundamental physics. That's this parameter here, and I've got the frequency of the axion in hertz at the top, and an EV in the bottom, depending on whether you're a particle physicist or an AMO guy, whichever you like. Uh, and here's what you have. So anywhere above this region, the axion is already ruled out by, you know, solid limits, uh, astrophysics, things like that. Uh, the solid purple line, that is basically where the QCD axion lives. Okay, there, there's a solid prediction because the mass and the coupling are sort of inversely proportional to each other. So once you know one, you know the other. Okay. The red dotted line is the fundamental magnetization noise. Okay. And ADMX, the current experiment that searches for axions is somewhere here, in this narrow range of frequency. And the two solid lines we have, the red and the blue, these are basically our uh, phase one and phase two experiments, uh, where we are currently limited by the magnetometer sensitivity, right? But the fundamental magnetization noise is still a, a, a bit below. So one, if, you, if your magnetometers get better, one can go a bit down the parameters. But as you clearly see, while we can cover a lot of this parameter space for general axions, these are just as motivated, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, we don't quite get to the QCD axion with this particular set. At least not for a while. Uh, in fact, this method turns out to be so powerful that uh, already with existing data, okay, uh, there are people who have uh, sort of measured spin precession all the time for like various other reasons. So uh, if they happen to have sampled the data at sufficiently high frequencies, they can already put limits over them. Okay, and we're working with groups uh, in minds to do that. Second possibility now is to move on to the QCD axion itself, the for the QCD axion, 
And here we require a lot of large electric fields to, to make this happen. And those are possible not in a sort of garden variety material, but sort of with these federal electric fields. Uh, these are materials where there are very large internal electric fields in the system. And that's kind of what we want to use. And here's the money part of that. Uh, so GD here is a coupling uh, you know, of the dipole moment uh, to the axion field here, and this is the nucleon for that. Okay. And uh, the mass in EV, and uh, in first the top, and this is the GD parameter. Okay. Once again, if your, if your GD is say, smaller than about 10 to the minus 10, uh, it's larger than 10 to the minus 10, the whole thing is ruled out okay, by existing data. And uh, the red dotted line is the magnetization point, the fundamental magnetization point. And the blue line, and the purple line is where the QCD axiom is. Okay. And uh, these are like phase one and phase two style measurements, two things that you're thinking about. Uh, phase two is of course more aggressive, but we think it's doable. And anywhere where the red line intersects this purple line, we can see the QCD axiom. So as you can see, uh, this concept will be sensitive to QCD axions already with more or less of current technology, uh, with, uh, like here in this region. And this point roughly corresponds to where the uh, coupling of the QCD axion is the gut scale, uh, and here is the pound scale. Also. So anywhere below the gut scale, uh, I mean anywhere above the gut scale, we are immediately sensitive to it. And if technology gets better, we can also probe more and more of this parameter. Because currently we're just limited by magnetron. So if magnetron does get better, we can probe it. So, so, so that's one reason why we're very, very excited about it. So now we're going to move on from uh, axions and talk about something different, uh, dark photons. And the idea here is how we detect a dark photon of the radio. Okay. And here are the lead experimenters is Kent Urban and Stanford. Uh, dark photons are easy to get. Okay. I'm not going to give you more motivation for this. Uh, and it's very reasonable that if these particles exist, they're coupled to operators of this form, FF prime. Okay. Uh, so particles of this point of view, this is a dimension four operator, so no matter where the new physics exists, it will always have some effect like this at, at the low end. And then if you write down the Lagrangian, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's a lot like a regular photon. So F here is a, is a normal photon, F prime is a dark photon, except it's got a mass. Okay. So if you, so if you now write it in the dark, uh, in what's called a mass basis, you basically see that every standard model particle that has an electric charge acquires a small epsilonic charge under the dark photon. That's it. Okay. So you, your electron and the proton, they, they acquire a small epsilonic correction through that charge under the dark so think of it very much as a photon with a small mass, but suppressed couplings to watch out for. And here's the basic idea. Uh, if this thing is a dark matter, there's an oscillating E prime field, right? That's how it's dark matter everywhere. And this oscillating, oscillating E prime field can drive currents behind electromagnetic shields. So if you, if you build a shield, it will block all of electromagnetism. This guy, however, is going to go through the shield because he's got really small couplings. And once he's inside the shield, he's still coupled to electrons, so he can then drive currents. That's the idea. The simple idea. Well, there's, an, there's an annoying fact, because it's always an annoying fact. And the annoying fact here is that uh, we can consider sending the mass of this particle to zero. Okay. If you did that, you basically notice that the Lagrangian becomes this. And here, what you notice is that there is just one linear combination that couples to electrons. Okay. So I can just define that to be the photon, as a photon that we normally see. And there will be an, an orthogonal linear combination that will be completely sterile. It won't talk to anyone. Okay, so you, that's some mathematics you can do. Uh, so the thing to note here is that all the physical effects of this particle have to decouple as the mass goes to zero. Okay, and, and that's something that you always see. Okay, uh, moving on from that theory aside, uh, let's see how to see how to detect the dark matter radio station. Okay. So there's an oscillating heat prime field. As I said, there's a shield that you put, and inside that you stick an LC oscillator. A tunable LC oscillator, because once again we don't know the frequency of the dark matter. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to tune that uh, radio to see if there is one particular frequency where you pick up on. So what does the signal look like? Uh, again, there's a metallic box and there's an oscillating E prime field that's going in there. And as you get inside, uh, what you'll notice is that the uh, conduction uh, uh, electron in the wall, right? So the dark E prime field goes in. Is going to move uh, charged particles around, and that will basically generate screening electric field inside. Okay. Uh, so you can calculate that, and what you effectively find is that inside this box, right, uh, this E prime field gets converted to a real magnetic field, a magnetic field of electro of normal electromagnetism, uh, except it's suppressed by this mass times the size of this of the box. 
So similarly, when the, when the mass goes to zero, the entire effect has to decon. Okay, and that's basically how you see that. Uh, but what this therefore looks like is that inside the shield, this is a time-varying global uh, global magnetic field. Okay, so if you stick in an, 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 an uh, inductor in there, that will get excited, and if you have a capacitor and you tune correctly, you can get a resonance. So here's the projected sensitivity of where we think we can go. Okay. Uh, uh, so this is again the coupling epsilon in the, 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 here the y-axis and uh, the, the mass here in ED. Okay. Uh, there are various bounds. And once again, what we notice is that as the mass goes to zero, you can see that all the bounds disappear. For example, if the mass is below about 10 to minus 50 dB or about a third or so, the bounds on epsilon are, are nothing. They don't even exist. Uh, and here, for this particular uh, um, proposal, the dominant source of noise is going to be thermal noise, right? Your LC oscillator will have some thermal noise, that's going to limit you. Uh, so we consider two kinds of uh, stages, stage one where everything's at room temperature, stage two where we cool, uh, assuming we get the money for the cryo and all that stuff. Um, and again, uh, we set the maximum possible resonance to about 10 of the okay. uh, And we assume that we take about you know a month or so to scan per decade. And as you can see, we actually cover a lot of parameter space, okay? much, much uh, larger than what current experiments are doing. Again, ADMS is somewhere around here. They are accidentally sensitive to these things, uh, but then we can do a lot better. There are many, many orders of magnitude. And finally, I'm going to talk about how one can detect something called a V minus L uh, gauge boson, okay, with accelerometers. So this concept is very new. It's actually under rapid development. Uh, we're still figuring out what the best experiment will be. Experimentalist work with this. Uh, so here is V minus L. Okay. As I said, other than electromagnetism, this is the only other anomaly free uh, combination. I mean, this is the only thing that else has detected symmetry in the standard model. And this guy looks a lot like the dark photon. Okay, there's, a, there's some uh, kinetic term, there's some mass, but he couples directly to charge. Every standard model particle has a charge on it. Both of protons, neutrons, electrons, and neutrinos are all charged on it. Okay, so that's how it's different from electromagnetism. So what this means is that electrically neutral atoms are now going to be charged under V minus L, okay? Uh, because there's a net neutron number, and if your atoms don't come attached to neutrinos, so your atoms are going to be charged under the V minus L. And because atoms are charged, there are incredibly strong limits on uh, the strength of the couple. Okay, uh, they have to be essentially subgravitational for a measure in terms of, of the neutron mass, g less than 10 to the minus 21. One well, can ask, uh, if it's below this, is it even possible to detect it? How can you detect it? So weak. So once again, there's an oscillating field, right? If this thing is dark matter, there's an oscillating E prime field. The E prime is now the V minus L E prime, the electric field of this oscillating everywhere. And your neutral atoms are actually charged under the sun. That's the whole point. That's how the bond was was printed. And that can therefore accelerate atoms. Okay. So a very reasonable thing to calculate is uh, the acceleration per baryon. Okay. How much do you accelerate per baryon? And what you find is that the acceleration is about 10 to the minus 10 meter per second squared. Um, a current atomic accelerometer can already measure, and I'm, I'm much below that, uh, 10 to the minus 12 meter per second squared. Of course, that depends on the frequency where you are, things like that. But, but already you see that you know we have, done, we have built a lot of very good accelerometers. LIGO, for example, is a fantastic accelerometer. Right? Uh, and AMO, the, 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 the sort of, sort of polar bills, again, a very good accelerometer. So, uh, signal-wise, it seems measurable. There's a very cute fact about the signal, though, which is that um, this force depends upon the net neutron number of your atom, right? Um, so if you take two atoms, say rubidium-85 and rubidium-87, like just for an example, and you drop them, and you try to do a typical equivalence principle sort of experiment, what will happen is that the, there will be a force on these guys in the dark matter. So the dark matter is all around you. And it will act, of course, differently on the rubidium 85 and the rubidium 87. So it will cause the equivalence principle violation. But most importantly, it will cause a time dependent equivalence principle violation. Right? Because your dark matter electric field is oscillating back and forth at something. Okay? And of course, that's very, very useful if you're trying to beat down noise, things like that. This is a fundamentally an AZ measurement. That is a much better thing to do. Okay? Uh, so I think, in many ways, this is very, very promising. Uh, and, and, and sort of a good direction to go forward to see this kind of work. With that, let me uh, move on to my concluding slides. Uh, so, um, 
the best thing to do to search for wealth. Okay, so this all started off by Goodman Witten back in the 80s. And uh, back then they were thinking about uh, cross sections that are really, you know, friends of mine 28 centimeters square. Okay. Very small back then, but uh, lots of things big compared to what we are doing today. Uh, where we have probed very, very deep in this parameter space. In fact, this plot is pretty dated. Uh, we have pretty, you know, uh, fast these in this uh, And the key reason why that happened was because the technology that they thought about was scalable. You could build a small detector, understand it really well, and then make it bigger and bigger. And of course, there's a lot of hard work from a lot of experimentalists to make that possible. And through this entire journey, there were many things that you could, use, that you could have seen. Okay, uh, at 10 to the minus 30, uh, 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 centimeters squared, you were essentially looking for uh, the scattering of dark matter mediated through the z boson. Yes. Today, we are essentially probing the Higgs sector. Uh, if you don't see anything, we will start probing into the W sector, things like that. Okay. Uh, but, uh, and there's lots of things that you could have seen. I think a similar thing is true for these oscillating fields as well. As I said, there's like, you know, many possible ways in which these oscillating fields can couple to us. Uh, they're very natural, very reasonable. And uh, then all of these are sort of scalable uh, experiments. You can build a small experiment, a small NMR setup, you understand it really well, then you start making it bigger and bigger. And as you make it bigger and bigger, your noise will go down, your, your signal will scale. So it's, it's, it's very similar. It just requires all that hard work to go into this. And thankfully, I won't be doing the hard work, being a book, so that's even better. <coughs> Let me leave you with the final slide here. Okay. Uh, I've got this large dark matter landscape possibility, this huge list of masses. Okay, and uh, uh, the wimps are here, all these bosons live somewhere here. Now, the point is, if you thought the dark matter was a whip, right, the right way to search for it is exactly what people are doing right now, which is that you have to look for hot particle scattering. Okay. And that's because the dark matter was a heavy rock wandering around the universe. The best way to see a rock is to wait for it to hit you, and then you make a device and you see it. Okay. This is how the whip experiments are basically working. However, the dark matter is very light. It is more appropriate to think of it not as a heavy rock, but rather as a wind going through the galaxy. The best way to find wind is not to wait for each individual wind molecule to come and hit you and deposit a tiny amount of energy. That's very, very hard. But really, what you want to do is look for the coherent effects of the wind in terms of moving the wind, for example, or in this case, coherently moving a nuclear spin, or coherently accelerating atoms, or accelerating uh, columns, like that. Okay. And that's a very, very reasonable thing to do. Uh, so, so essentially, one can searching for time dependent moments of coherent classical fields becomes a sort of a new way to think about how to search for these kinds of dark matter particles. And once you say that um, you want this dark matter particle to be natural, right, then essentially the game is set by symmetry. There are only about six possibilities yeah, at the sort of leading level. And uh, it appears that you can actually search for all these six possibilities. And these frequencies are very interesting. They can naturally be sort of lab accidentally. Even though these particles come from like, you know, really high scales, God scale, things like that, uh, due to several reasons, the, the frequencies are very lab accessible, hertz and gigahertz. And so it's something that one really should make use of. And, and these are like lab scale experiments, they're not billion dollar book offers, right? These are some things that you can build in the lab and understand it really well and try to make space. Of course, this is just something that I have thought about, right? Um, sort of my group of people. Uh, but really, I, I have sort of opened this to the rest of the audience, right? I mean, there's a big parameter space still out there that one should actually go and search for. And uh, I think that's very, very important. Now if you think about it, right, this is kind of an interesting game. Because the lowest frequency that you need to get to is about 10 to the minus 22 EV, or an inverse zero. Okay. Now that is set by something like the size of the galaxy. That's where that number really comes from. Now that could easily be like a thousand years. Okay. In which case there would be no hope in hell for us to see it, shy of a biological breakthrough that, that allows us to live for a thousand years. But uh, for whatever reason, that just happens to uh, roughly be, you know, the human life scale, right? So if, uh, it's in, the fact that it's in principle possible to cover this whole range, I think, makes it very exciting, and we should really do what we can. Go on. Thank you.
No, no, V doesn't set the frequency, okay? The frequency is set by something totally different. Frequency set by fundamental physics. What V sets is the core of time. Okay, the, and V is the velocity of the dark matter in the galaxy. That's something we know to be a order of the minus two. Yeah. But, you know, gravity doesn't care, right? So whether you fall or I fall, we fall the same rate. So, what are the possibilities for carrying out astrophysical experiments to test the uh, variety of low energy or long time scale? Uh, astrophysical, in the sense, you mean like two astrophysical measurements? Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know how you would get better than this, uh, than that kind of doing that. Uh, there's a speculative idea that I'm working on with uh, Jerry Ostreicher. He doesn't want me to mention this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> which is that there is this funny thing that globular clusters don't tend seem to have dark matter, right? Uh, supposedly something that he, he, he very strongly believes this. Uh, uh, and a natural way in which that can happen is that the dark matter happens to have the right kind of mass, that it just does not happen to fit in the globular cluster, right? So that would be a natural way in which the globular cluster would be devoid of dark matter, but it would be there everywhere else. So that, that actually is somewhere around this region. Uh, Follow up to that. Um, does uh, the scale of inflation affect the production of axions in the universe? And if so, do future polarization experiments affect the parameter space? Right, good. So it is true that uh, um, for one specific kind of axion called the QCD axion, right, inflation can play a limit on this. Uh, however, those limits are model dependent. Like, you basically have to assume that you know particle physics all the way from uh, the QCD scale to the inflationary scale. Uh, to really place that limit. Uh, so when bicep 2 came out, I was like, oh my god, what's going on? And I thought about it and I figured that, you know, actually, uh, other, there are reasonable modifications that you can do to the physics, which eliminates that down. Right? So I would say that if it may, you know, suppose something like bicep is true and we actually really see, we're, we're very convinced that inflation occurred. It still means once you do these experiments, because this is actually a probe of the high temperature universe, something that we don't otherwise know anything about. I, I missed, wait, you started talking about a dark photon, and I missed entirely the concept of a dark photon. Oh, it's a photon with a mass. So it's a photon with a mass. Okay. Yeah. And a small photon. the mass go to zero in your limits? Yeah, yeah. So uh, what that basically says, no, no, I mean, that basically says that uh, for that specific kind of dark photon, if the mass went to zero, then all of its effects have to vanish. Okay. Okay. And uh, so if, you, if I show you my slide, you'll actually see that. Uh, that I'm not cheating, that indeed, as, as you go to lower mass, things do get harder. I'm moving less and less that's not. Precisely because of the fact that all of my physical effects become. Yeah. So can you elaborate a bit on what you said about the equivalence principle violation? Because, I mean, there are pretty tight limits on that. So how do you Right, so that's where these limits actually come from. So when I say G is 10 to the minus 21 or whatever. And, and it's again a question of the mass, etc., etc. So the the thing is, you know, fundamentally, your, your rigorous principle violation experiments, they're first of all talking about the Earth and the Moon and how much they fall, and that basically sets up a uh, limit on this coupling G. It just turns out that if you thought the B minus L was all set up with the dark matter, you can probe uh, much lower values of G than currently constrained by uh, by uh, equal principle experiments. And that's because of the fact that essentially, you know, uh, as I said, like, uh, you 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 add up the charge under this, and so you've got this electric field oscillating around. I can oscillate things for you. How does the um, temperature and local density of the dark matter affect your predictions? Uh, so the uh, way I made all these plots was to basically say I, I equate the local dark matter density to the amplitude of the field, you know, m squared a squared, right? Um, uh, so if the amplitude goes up. Uh, of course, the uh, I mean, if the, lo if the local energy density went up, the field amplitude would go up. But you know, that's like a square root. That square a square is equal to rho. So a goes as square root of rho. And the temperature? The temperature, in a sense, uh, what people mean the temperature is like the local velocity, right? That's the thing. So if the velocity uh, goes up or down, I mean, uh, what the velocity sets is essentially the golden sign that you have to see it. Just, just, you know, like one over mv squared, right? So if the if the uh, velocity was higher, the uh, maximum Golden time would go down. 
if the loss is down, it's the coherent time will be positive. But it will be very hard for the dark matter to have a coherent time or other a uh, velocity bigger than about 10 minus 3, because then it won't be in the galaxy. So it could be lower. That's possible uh, if the Earth, you know, if the solar system happens to be co-rotating along the dark disk, etc., etc., etc. Things that we don't quite know about. Uh, but we all, all the minus three is a very conservative estimate on what that coherent time. So very comfortable. Anything else? Yeah. So, like part of Therefore, I think genetically you can totally uh, um, the, the density, right? The dark matter of smoke. This is basically the same problem which happens with the axiom. Yeah. Uh, unless you uh, have a condition after imitation, you have very small, it's a line of an angle. Uh, if you have any Right. So, actually, that again is a bound that's very specific to the QCD axiom. So, uh, you know, this is some uh, thing. Basically, the way these fields behave in cosmology is that uh, if they had a mass earlier, then they would have a lot of time to damp down and not be a problem. Uh, so, for the QCD axiom, because of all the baggage associated with it, the mass only turns on at the QCD scale. That's where there are specific terms on it. But for general particles like this, you know, the, the mass is the hot parameter. It sort of just exists all the time in the Lagrangian. In which case, these bounds are really not, I mean, just for, for, for regions that we can probe experimentally, those bounds don't really apply.